So, first of all, I'd like to talk to you both about, obviously you've both retired. Um, you've both taken very different paths after riding your bikes. I'm going to talk to you individually about them, but Steve, we'll start with you first. When you were about to retire, uh, we spoke quite a lot, and I don't know if a lot of people know the effort that you went into after retiring. You did a lot of other things, not just become a, a director. You're a very busy man. You like to keep busy, but just let us know how the, the INEOS role came along. Okay, so around, like, I don't know, towards the end of my career, I was thinking, oh, the last, I never, could never be a director, never be a director. <laughs> and then, um, I don't know, I started studying, like, the last year, 2019, studied a lot. And then when I stopped, um, I didn't really want to stop. I wanted to continue, but I had a bit of an injury, which didn't help the contract negotiations. <laughs> and then um, I had a year which coincided with COVID, um, where I was doing a little bit of TV, a little bit of this and that, and uh, I, I was bored, to be honest. <laughs> so I, I wanted to um, get back in. I really missed the sport. I really missed the performance side, like the goals, all that. And... Um, I talked to G a lot, I talked to Fran Miller, who was in charge of Ineos at the time. And then just through those conversations, really, they invited me in, went in, had a chat, talked about tactics, strategy, all that kind of stuff. And uh, they offered me a role, and the role was quite open. It was um, DS stroke coach. And um, we've, over this year, we've, yeah, done, done quite well, quite refine the role a little bit so next year I will be a DS proper DS so that's how, that's how it went yeah. and knowing what Steve's like Steve as a um, as a bike rider you were um, you were a pain basically <laughs> you were never Steve was always either at the front off the front or at the back generally towards the back <laughs> for most of the time but I think with Steve that through my knowledge that when you were riding, I was never in a break with you, luckily. <laughs> um, I don't, were you in a break with him? No, I saw him at the back a lot. Yeah, like, we spent a lot of back, time yeah. at the back. I was like, oh, cool, Steve's at the back. We're yeah, on. but I think there was always a worry when you went in the breakaway, because it was kind of like a, you and Thomas de Gent were kind of the riders that if you knew you were there, it was kind of like, oh, no, this is happening, this is happening now. But you targeted, you targeted stages particularly, and the way that you won wasn't... Um, it was clever, it was the right way to do it, but it was very clever. Can you talk to us a little bit about how you did it? Because it is, um, you know, I went in a Tour de front stage by doing that, the clever riding that you did, but could you talk to us the, the way that you like to race, basically? We, we've got a long time, so feel free. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, um, you know, I think I had, a, I had quite a long career, so I wasn't always this breakaway rider. I'd, I'd say that, you know, there was parts of my career where I was very much a domestique doing that role, but people remember me for these victories, I think. Um, but I guess in my career, I was always, like, looking... It's quite hard to get your head around what the sport is. It's like, it's a, it's a team sport, but it's a team sport for an individual, and that, that's, that's quite... It's, it's kind of unique, you know? So, like, you can be a really good teammate but it, it eventually the individual wins. And, and I was really passionate about racing. I really wanted to race. I really wanted to win. And um, if the balance shifted too much towards being a team rider, I wasn't getting the best out of myself. It was like, I didn't enjoy it basically. And I needed to love what I was doing. And um, it was difficult to find like the right balance of, of, of team really, where it, where it allowed you the opportunities and not too much responsibility. And uh, when I did, um, then that allowed me the space then to um, identify races and stages where I thought he could win and just really be quite specific and target those stages, really. But you were very specific in how you won a bike race. It was, um, I think if, as I spoke about, if you're in a breakaway, it was, it, it was almost like you were methodical with how you were going to win and it was always I think the Tour de France stage where you won on Mandela Day beating uh, Bardet and who's the other guy the French guy Pino Pino I think on that climb there it's a super steep climb have you all seen it when Steve won in the orange helmet and um, I've watched it a few times and just going up that climb you were almost at the back on that group you're just in the middle of the group and I think up that climb you you were never the rider that anyone expected to win that day did you know you could win that day 
Can you talk us through the finish? Because you know what happens better than anyone. No, I didn't think I could win that day is the answer. But, um, yeah, you kind of, I kind of removed the opposition out of it. And it's like a time trial, really. So, um, last three kilometres, uh, well, last 4K of the stage, three of it was uphill, quite steep. Very steep. The bottom of that climb, um, a climb up to Mond, is, uh, is a little bit, it's, a, it's less steep, so there's more benefit from draft. Hence why I was at the back, because you get a benefit from the draft and your power's lower. And then it's just kind of just managing the effort then to the top and not letting, getting carried away with like the emotion. Because if you go into the red too early, you're just going to explode on the climb, which I think is probably what happened to some of those riders who were on paper were much better climbers than me. But I, I was able to stay calm and manage the effort really well. And then um, we got over the top and I could see the, the two French lads and then, um, yeah, caught them and knew the finish as well. well so, yeah. It's a nice day. It's a beautiful day. And doing what you're doing now, you are a, you're a, you're a director within Ineos, a little bit of coaching as well. But is this something you're trying to shift to the, the younger riders in terms of how to race a little bit? Because I've got to say it, there's a, lot of the back. <laughs> there's a lot of stupid riders out there, and that's not being horrible to anyone, but there is a lot of silliness involved. And I think, you know, if you look at you as an example of how to ride a bike and how to target something, for me, it's always been an example of how to race a bike properly. If you're targeting something, you always nailed it pretty much if you wanted to win that day. And I think, is that something that you try to pass across to these younger younger generation? No, I, th I think I was good at that, doing that, but I was also met weaknesses. So I think when you think about Ineos, where they are now, um, you know, for maybe like the last decade, they've dominated the tour. Froomey, G, Egam, they won a lot of Tour de France's and now, uh, currently, sat here now, I don't think we have the favourite for the Tour de France. I think that's fair to say. But I think with that, it's less responsibility to control the race, but that gives us more opportunity to race. Sit at the back. <laughs> to, to, <laughs> no, no, not sit at the back, but to, to race the bicycle. And um, I think that's what, that's what I, I really like about bike racing. I think a lot of the lads on the bus and around the team, they really like thinking about winning and trying to win. And, and, and at the moment, it's a really exciting place for Ineos to be, I think. I think so as well. And are you trying to push that a little bit more? Because the directors are very old school within that team. They've been around a while. Are you trying no, to change it up? No, I think it's like one of those, you know, you, you've got, they've got a pattern that's a formula that's worked so well. Seven out of whatever it 12, is. Twelve, five. Whatever eight. it is, they've won a lot of grand tours. So it's a really good pattern that's worked. But we have to evolve, you know, and that's what we're trying to do. And um, that's what's that's exciting. Brilliant. And Ian, you've obviously retired, taken a very different path. You're not a director. Would you like to be a director, though? No, I don't think so. <laughs> um, yeah. With me? We, yeah, I can do it with Steve. Yeah. I think we could all work with Steve. It'd be brilliant. <laughs> No, but where you're at now, you're obviously doing a, a lot of gravel racing. We can see you here winning. I asked you behind the stage, are you still training a lot? And you just politely said, nah, man. I mean, I'm still riding. Well, it's funny enough, when I first like, announced that I was retiring, Steve messaged me and said, hey, dude, let's do Cape Epic. And <laughs> now, he's, now he's too busy for that. Um, yeah, but I stopped at the end of 2019. Um, and, you know, I, I took a full-time position at Wahoo. And, like, you know, just as part of my role there, we're going to events and... I was going to be at these gravel events anyways, so I decided that I might as well, you know, at least partace, participate in, in these events, and um, it's really taken off in the U.S., and, and we were saying backstage that the attention that gravel has gotten on the media is far bigger than the competition level at, at these gravel races. I mean, obviously, there's some super strong riders there, but, you know, at the... They're all, like, ex-pros that are doing it as well now. Yeah. It's becoming, yeah. like, um, I'm going to retire and go to gravel and win that, because I was... I was not good enough on the road. No offence, I'm not saying you weren't good enough on the road. <laughs> but it's, it's kind of like that, that pathway that enables... I think, as like Steve said, we love riding our bikes, we love racing them, but gravel's very much that aspect of you can have a lot more fun, even though that looks hard still. <laughs> I mean, I think for, for a lot of people who do retire for, for various reasons, you know, and they do, and I think Steve said this, like, when he first stopped, he's like, I want to keep riding, because like, that's all you know. And so it is a way for you know, ex-pros or former, you know, world tour riders to like continue riding in a different, in a different way. And it, it's completely different just as far as, you know, 
the races are 200 miles and you're only doing you know, a handful of races a year, you're not on the road 200 plus days a year going to altitude training camps. Um, so if anything, it's like allowed me to like rediscover my love for just riding the bike and how, how much I do still love it. And also I retired at you know, 28 years old, so. And did you plan to stop? No, not at all. Um, I crashed at Torino in 2019 and had a pretty bad concussion, so I didn't race the rest of the season. Um, and so I was, you know, I was on a contract year. I was at Katusha at the time, and the team was, was folding. So I was just trying to, like, keep my head down to try to, you know, recover and then figure, okay, what am I going to do next? And just through the process of spending a whole season of not, you know, being in Europe and not racing, I kind of came to this realization and conclusion that, like, you know what, like, that was an awesome period of my life. But you're going to have to close that curtain at some point. And I just felt like that was the, was the right time. And... Yeah, I mean, it's, it's an awesome lifestyle. Um, there's things I still miss about, you know, especially living in Europe and just, you know, essentially just riding, that's all you have to do. Um, but no, I mean, if I hadn't crashed, I probably would still be, I would imagine that I'd still be racing today. And would you still like to be racing if you had the opportunity? Is it something that you would, if someone said to you now, look, we can give you a contract Steve next year. Steve wants to give me a contract. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't, I, I, Bloody honest, hell, mate, what about me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <Can I> go? <laughs> I'm right here. <laughs> <laughs> we found this guy. He's really good at sitting at the back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I mean, I guess knowing what I know now and just like, you know, where I'm at, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go back to, to that. And I appreciate it, and I admire, you know, my friends and riders that are still doing it, but um, you sacrifice a lot to be at that level, and, you know, I, yeah, I very much kind of decided that that was enough. Nice. And there is an armband you're wearing on here. Uh, we'd like to talk about it a little bit, if you can just see it there on the picture. Just wipe in the, probably the blood, sweat, and tears, probably a little cow poo as well off your arm. Um, could you talk to us about the armband? Yeah, so that is a uh, transgender pride, well, it's actually a sweatband. Um, but yeah, so I, my nephew last year came out as, as being, you know, trans, and it was something that, you know, I hadn't really thought about much at all, you know, being a, a cyclist and, you know, just focusing so much on, my, on myself and kind of my experience in life. Um, so it's something that, you know, I've been more aware of and just trying to learn more about. And, you know, I have a couple of friends who are, you know, racing as well and, and doing gravel stuff and... Um, they're transgender athletes as well, and it, you know, for me, it was just a way of, you know, supporting them, and, you know, because gravel events, there's no categories, you know, everyone's on the start line together, there's not a, a male, a female, you know, a junior, it's, everyone's there, um, and just the participation kind of mindset of gravel has been awesome in the sense that everyone's there racing together, so just as a way of, of me, you know, supporting my, my nephew and, you know, my friends who are racing in the sport, I decided to, you know, order some bands and, you know, pass them out on the start line to a few folks, um, yeah, and it's been, it's been awesome to see kind of the impact of, of that and realize that, you know, we have this unique opportunity to welcome kind of new people to a, to a sport that has largely been kind of, you know, there's been, been barriers and boundaries. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to have some questions.